Hi, I'm Larry Nespoli with the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. At New Jersey's community colleges, we believe that our students, as well as all citizens, need to be informed about the important issues facing higher education. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway. Funding has been provided by Jersey Central Power and Light, Passaic County Community College, Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. The New Jersey Association of Health Underwriters, New Jersey's Benefits Specialist. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. New Jersey Council of County Colleges. And by Johnson & Johnson. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. And by Meadowlands Regional Chamber, building essential connections that drive business growth. I don't get tired of that open. It's really great. Uh, welcome to State of Affairs. I am Steve Adubato, coming to you from the Agnes Veris NJ TV studio in beautiful downtown New York, New Jersey. It is my pleasure to introduce two very special friends of uh, the series, Betsy Ryan, who is uh, president of New Jersey Hospital Association, and Larry Downs, CEO of the Medical Society of New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, big picture, healthcare, hospitals. Um, but before we talk ACA, what may or may not be going on in Washington, its impact on those of us in New Jersey, repeal, replace, who knows. But there is a new initiative that has just started. Read about it in some of the trades. It's called the New Jersey Healthcare Executive Leadership Academy. Two of you are part of it, your organizations. What is it? Why does it matter? So we're, the Medical Society and the Hospital Association have partnered with the Association of Health Plans to create a leadership academy to bring together the emerging leaders in each industry in a shared learning collaborative. I think the goal is to break down the barriers that exist between us uh, naturally. We fight a lot in Trenton, and, and uh, we wanted to bring together and have some shared learning, mm -hmm. leadership, and work on a very important issue to the state of New Jersey. And Larry, Seton Hall University is involved in this, correct? Yes, yeah, Seton Hall is our academic partner. Um, again, we're trying to bring together three pretty disparate uh, industries that um, are encased in, in the healthcare <coughs> industry. So physicians who are providing care on the ground, facilities, hospitals, long-term care facilities, and then insurers who are paying for the care. I said, play this out for a second. So these healthcare executives come together, and I saw the list, and um, by the way, go online. People can go online and find out who these folks are, but they're healthcare executives from all different arenas, right? They go through this academy. They're trained by healthcare executives and professionals. They come out as better leaders. How does that impact the rest of us? I think the, the most promise we have is to be able to build relationships where relationships don't currently exist. Our hope is. What do you mean they don't exist? Our hope is after the um, completion of this academy, folks will have relationships to the point where they can, a doctor can pick up the phone and call a healthcare executives to work through a problem, call a, uh, have a better relationship with their hospital executives. The problems that we're focusing on, and this first academy focuses on improving end of life care, these are significant problems that cannot be solved by physicians alone, hospitals alone, or health plans alone. So we need to have a collaborative uh, relationship in order to solve these pressing health care problems. Betsy, long overdue. Absolutely. I think we tend to operate in our silos, and this is breaking down those silos and creating the relationships to tackle uh, important issues, including end of life, and we hope into the future. Well, let's talk about end of life for a second. Some of the research that we've seen shows that New Jersey spends, I believe, more than any other state in the nation in those last few years of life, meaning in terms of health care. Why is that? We do, and we, one thing we know is more care is not always better care. And I think this collaborative will foster physicians, hospitals, insurers to have a better awareness of that, to have that difficult conversation with the patient, 
the patient's family, so they can make an informed choice, and it's all about what they want. Okay, let's do this. Can we shift over, if we could? By the way, and one more thing, the candidates, they are from hospitals, they are physician leaders, they are, who else, who else am I missing? Uh, insurers, and also it's not just hospitals, it's post-acute care providers as well. And potentially actually change the delivery of health care, Larry, you re a really believe that? Absolutely. Our first uh, lead-off session, which occurred just a couple of weeks ago, we brought in families and patients mm -hmm. who had gone through really great end-of-life experiences with family members and really poor ones. And so we're patient-centered and we're trying to bring the patients choice into this and make sure patients' choices are honored from every single aspect that we're, we can. Okay, so we are taping in early March 2017. Uh, President Trump speech to uh, Congress, lots of talk about what may or may not happen with the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. What is at stake? Put this in context for everyone, Betsy. What is at stake for the citizens of New Jersey in terms of what Congress and the President, President Trump, may or may not do as it relates to the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as the ACA. Here's what's at stake. Under the ACA, we've reduced our number of uninsured from 1.3 million to roughly 500,000. So we have 800,000 people who have been insured through Medicaid expansion or through the marketplace, and they are in danger of losing their insurance coverage. One second, Betsy. I was watching the president speak, and he said, quote, Obamacare is unraveling. It's falling apart. How could it be falling apart if more people are covered than ever before? Well, I think in part, he's, he's not focused on the Medicaid expansion. He's focused on the marketplace where individuals have to go online and purchase insurance coverage, may or may not get a subsidy. My understanding is Congress has removed a large part of that subsidy, so that's part of why it's unraveling. So, like, how do you... Listen, we don't know what's going to happen, and we're not going to try to get ahead of this. We're not a news program. We're an analysis program. So things may happen, but they're happening slowly. When the president said, we didn't realize how complicated health care really is, you're smiling, did everyone else realize how complicated it was? I, I think it's the most complicated issue of our time. And I think that what Betsy had just mentioned about the individual market is where um, the biggest problem will be. We have states in this country where there's only one choice on an exchange. In New Jersey, we have two choices on the exchange. And I think we need to figure out how to get the millions of people who are not purchasing insurance now, people have said no thank you to purchasing a, a plan, even right. though it's mandatory, to get them engaged in the system is the biggest challenge that the Congress will face. So when, when, when those in Congress and the President and others say, we're going to repeal Obamacare, we promise we're going to do it, and people cheer, what's the problem with that? Well, they're not yet talking about what the replacement plan is. The president has also said, I'm going to repeal and replace it almost simultaneously. What does the replacement have to have, in your opinion, to protect those who are most vulnerable in this state? What we are looking at is coverage. Well, 800,000 New Jerseyans, 22 million Americans have coverage. Uh, there's a difference between coverage and access, and I worry about that. But what about, respectfully, what about those business owners who are saying they're having a very hard time um, and individual citizens who are having a very hard time affording the care. I mean, doesn't that weigh into it as well, the economic side? It, it absolutely does. Um, but the people who have coverage um, need to maintain it. Um, our, our physicians have looked at this, and we have supported universal coverage for people for a long time. Um, so make, single payer? Not single payer, but access to insurance, access okay. to, a, to a, um, an insurance policy for everyone. Um, now, whether that's through a marketplace or whether it's through high-risk pools, having access to um, good quality insurance is important. People who live longer, they do better um, health-wise if they have access to insurance. Before I let you out of here, the New Jersey Healthcare Executive Leadership Academy, if somebody wanted to find out watching us on public television, on Firehouse and every other platform, digital and otherwise, if they wanted to check out watching State of Affairs right now, who these people are and what the program is all about, how can they do it? They can go to www.msnj.org slash H-E-L-A, uh, Healthcare Executive Leadership Academy. Um, and there they'll see who the participants are. Um, they'll see our funders. We're funded graciously by the Physicians Foundation and the Rip Fannie Ripple Foundation here in New Jersey. Um, and they can see the, um, uh, the full roster and the um, uh, topics that we're working on. So it's important to fully disclose who provides the dollars. Larry. And Betsy, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you unraveling all that. Thanks, Steve. Still thank more you. to go. Thanks, Thanks for having us.
Stay tuned. We'll be right back on State of Affairs right after this. New Jersey voters will soon decide who will be New Jersey's next governor after Chris Christie. Now, my job is to ask the candidates the tough questions that you want answered. So follow me on Twitter, at Steve Adubato, and post the number one question that you want me to ask New Jersey's next governor. We are pleased to be joined on State of Affairs by uh, Nancy Meyer, president of North Jersey Media Group. Good to see you, Nancy. Good morning. It's good to be here. Let's uh, let folks know that the North Jersey Media Group um, has the record. Newspaper, what else? The record, the Herald News in Passaic County, 201 Magazine, and a group of 30 weeklies that cover North Jersey. That's a big media group. It's a big footprint with our free weeklies and our dailies and, of course, the website, NorthJersey.com. And you've been in the media business for a couple of years. Just a couple. I don't even <laughs> want to tell you how long. That starts to age Where me. Where before? Um, I was in Orlando, Florida at the Orlando Sentinel, and prior to that, the Hartford Current in Connecticut. But born and raised in New Jersey, so this is like a welcome home. Love it. Great to have you here. Um, Nancy, talk about this. The media landscape is a massive question, but if you were to say right now, I mean, our son who was 14 picked up the record the other day, which comes to our house every day. Thank you very much. Uh, and he said, Dad, and he was looking at the sports page, mm -hmm. of course. We follow Seton Hall. He looks basketball, and he looked, and he goes, Dad, I'm trying to go to the continuation page. How do I get there? And it hit me. He's having a hard time. He's not alone. Yeah. Newspapers are not going away. Please tell me that. Well, you know what? <laughs> I'm sorry, it took me a long way to get there. For our age group, let me tell you, you know what? The foreseeable future as we see it, we don't see a newspaper going away. At the same point, we can have even more coverage and larger audience in a digital footprint. So part of it is, how do we engage a 14-year-old? Okay, and that may be too young for us today, but how do we engage a 20, a 25-year-old? And they're engaging on our mobile platforms, our, what, you know, our website on desktop, more on mobile, and then, of course, through social media platforms. And you probably find that, you know, here at NJTV. Sure. You know, the fact is, we need to be able to reach them where they're looking, and that age group is looking on digital platforms. But I'm glad he's still reading the sports pages. He is. And, and by the way, let me fully disclose. I mean, you mentioned NJTV, which, and by the way, with our partners here at NJTV, you can find the content here on a lot of other platforms other than watching Mary Alice Williams and the Great News Team. And, uh, on broadcast or other, other platforms, mm -hmm. but we actually have a cross-promotional partnership, our production company and North Jersey Media Group. I won't yes. fully disclose that. But the other part of this that fascinates me is the question of, as you're creating more content on other platforms, right, the website and other apps, if you will, I ask myself, are you drawing people away from the print side because they have a choice to make and they go, oh, well, I'll go here or there, or are they looking at both? You know, and we look at it both from our number standpoint, but also just readership and engagement. It is both. Um, it's almost somebody watching TV in the evening also has maybe their desktop on their laptop on their lap, as well as their mobile phone. So when you look at it, multi-channel and people are multitasking. So they may want to read the newspaper in long form. They want to see a list on Facebook or a short story or a short breakout. And then a video because mm. they've gone onto the website and they want to hear you and I speaking, you know, it alive um, because they think they can engage better that way. So I think it's a little of both. But I also then say it's somewhat generational. While you and I, and I'll put us in that older right. age group, may be more reading more print, that younger age group is really not engaging with print at all. And where they want to see it is on the digital platform. So we need to be in all those different places to match where the audience wants to go. Talk about the video side. <clears throat> is there a significant demand, Nancy, for video content? Meaning, you got people yes. who are great writers. They're putting together great reporters, print report. Excuse me, um, they're great writers and can put together a great story. Is there pressure on everyone to be able to create video content? Absolutely. And the reason being is because that's where our reader, our user, and our audience wants it. And it's interesting because not everyone may be a great videographer. But guess what? With a mobile phone, a smartphone today, any one of us can produce content. So internally, we're training our reporters, and, and in some cases, multimedia journalists, as we might mm. call them, to be better, to be able to take a still photo. Mm. Um, because, hey, I can take a photo. May not be perfect, may not be to our photographer standards. But a videographer, because our audience wants it, to be able to shoot mm. a video, to be able to get something live, 
you may be driving down the street or, you know, the normal citizen be able to take a video. And we've seen all of those go live on social media. So video is good. Now, one thing we've also learned is it may not always be voice video, but even if you put um, type in there, people are engaging with that, but they want to see the moving photo. Shift gears. Um, the Trump administration. I'm not going to get into a whole big question about this, but you deal with this. The editorial side deals with it. To what degree are you concerned about the tone and the tenor of the dialogue between the Trump administration and the media overall? The whole, you're fake news, you're our enemy, the enemy of the American people. Or we just go about our business? You know, I, I sit there and I'm very concerned. I think, and, you know, not to get on a soapbox, but I will to some degree, I think what newspapers, what media companies do are very important. You know, our founding fathers felt that having a fourth estate and the First Amendment was vital. Smarter today than many of us are. So I think that still stands. I find it very important. I think the normal individual does. We have to stay true to our core values. We report each and every day. We try to get it right more than we get it wrong. And when we get it wrong, we'll come forward and say we got it wrong. But the fact is, the American public and a free democracy needs good media, mm. honest media reporting each and every day. So if we stay true to that core value of what we do, to me, it overrides a president for years who right now may be having a little bit of an antagonistic view to the, to the media. Last question. 2017, a huge year back in the state of New Jersey, governor will replace Chris Christie as the next chief yes. executive. The role of North Jersey Media Group and the role of the rest of us, but primarily your group, in terms of covering this governor's race, not from a horse race perspective, because mm. truthfully, that's not what State of Affairs is about. We're not interested in that. Exactly. I don't, I don't ex actually believe that most voters are interested in polls and who's ahead. What do you believe most voters care about, most readers and consumers, if you will, of content care about? I think they want to know about the issues, and I, want, I think they want to know honestly and getting good feedback from the future candidates. What are the issues? Where do they stand on those issues? open, honestly, and forthright. So I think economy is a big issue. I do think people feeling safe in this state as well as their country is a big issue. Um, but I also believe that, you know, the rights of what we have in this state as well as America are important. But I would first say, you know, the economy, health care, freedom, um, and the safety of our rights stand forward. Mm. To uh, Nancy's point, uh, on State of Affairs, if you've been watching us, we've only been around for a little bit. We are going through a series of in-depth interviews with uh, every major candidate running on the Democratic and the Republican side for uh, governor. And once the major party candidates are decided in June, there'll be one Democrat and one Republican. And I promise we'll continue those interviews. Um, Nancy, I can't thank you enough. Nancy Meyer is the president of North Jersey Media Group. Um, check them out online. NorthJersey.com. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you, it. Steve. Right thank there. you. State of Affairs. We'll be right back right after this. New Jersey voters will soon decide who will be New Jersey's next governor after Chris Christie. Now, my job is to ask the candidates the tough questions that you want answered. So follow me on Twitter, at Steve Adubato, and post the number one question that you want me to ask New Jersey's next governor. We are pleased to be joined by State Senator Bob Smith, who is chair of the Senate Environment and Energy Committee. Good to see you, Senator. Good to be here. Um, I ask you, energy policy in New Jersey, state of affairs of energy policy, you say? Terrible. Come on. That, that's right. You go to terrible right away? I go directly to terrible. Because? Because we, the leaders in this field should be our board of public utilities. And Excuse had, me, that's the regulatory body that's supposed to take care of these things. Not elected, but appointed. Correct. And they're not doing their job. You know, they, they think their job is to just deal with rate cases. And that's certainly one of their jobs. But we're not having the leadership that we should have to bring New Jersey, not into the 20th century, but at the 21st century. Example. Well, for example, we have a grid. And this grid is vulnerable to things like Storm Sandy. It also is an unfriendly grid for renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind. And as a matter of fact, one of the biggest failings of the VPU is they've had for five years the mandate from the legislature and this governor, who's not the most energy friendly guy in the whole world either. In your opinion? To, it, well, it is my opinion, but it's shared by many in the energy field, that they're not, they're not working to promote uh, offshore wind at all. What could they do? 
Uh, they should be adopting rules that allow for the appropriate credits to be given to the, the, the wind developers. The law was passed more than five years ago, and they've been sitting on it. And that's just one example. Uh, they're not making the grid friendly to renewables. They should, have, they should require the utilities to put more storage capability on the grid. And that's, that is something that can be done by order. They should be doing more energy efficiency, and they're not. We should be mandating smart thermostats. We should be adopting policies that uh, increase the energy efficiency in our state. And, you know, as a result of what I think is a failure of leadership, when the President Moroz was up and even Commissioner Fiordalizzo, both nice these guys, are, I voted against them in the judiciary. Excuse me, for interrupting, uh, Senator. These are members of, of the, the Board of Public Utilities. Correct. Let me ask you this. If you were to break it down and say, and this is what it means to the citizens of New Jersey as it relates to energy policy, what does it mean? Higher rates. All right, they are, the, if we were adopting policies that promoted more solar, remember, the sun is free. Wind is free. We don't have to buy natural gas. We don't have to buy fossil fuels. But we, the problem is we have a grid mm. that's resistant to renewables. Right. And we also have utilities who, I love them dearly, but they really don't want to see the further expansion of, of uh, renewables because that's not the traditional generation that they've been doing. And even though we've deregulated energy, we've said that energy generators should be separated from energy distributors, energy distributors being the utilities, mm. even though there's supposed to be a <clears throat> firewall, they still almost act in concert. Senator, let me ask you this. As we're here in New Jersey, here at the NJTV studios uh, in Newark, lots going on in Washington as it relates to energy. Yes but also environmental policy. Yes. I ask you about the Trump administration's environmental policies or what it seems to be doing around the environment and what it could potentially mean to New Jersey, and you say? Big trouble. And the big trouble is that uh, our DEP... Department and, of Environmental Protection. Right, which is the agency uh, responsible for protecting New Jersey's environment, enforces the, many of the federal laws. We're delegated with programs like the... National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, wetlands, a whole bunch of, you know, a myriad. Clean of Air Act, Clean Water Act. Everything. And uh, what the National Administration has done is to nominate and appoint a gentleman named Pruitt, who has an absolutely anti environmental record. member of Congress? Record. No, he was not a member not of Congress. Not a member of Congress. He was an That's attorney. Press, excuse me. He That's was an right. attorney general. Right. And he, it, all of his career as attorney general was to sue the EPA to stop the enforcement of environmental laws. You're also going to see a budget that does a hit on the Environmental Protection Agency. And that's not good for New Jersey. You know, we're on the East Coast. We get all the air pollution from the western United States. If air pollution laws are not being enforced, we've got a problem. The president just signed an executive order to allow pollu uh, coal pollution in streams. My bet is that the laws that we're supposed to enforce are going to change, and that's not going to be good for the health of New Jersey citizens. When you have air pollution, more asthma, emphysema, bronchitis, higher mortality, morbidity, uh, the effects could be terrible. The state of fossil fuel, you say? Um, are you the, open to a discussion? I am open to a discussion. I think that President Obama was right, which is that you should look at the full spectrum Everything on the table. Everything on the table. But there are policies that should be changed. So, for example, we right now have a Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission, FERC, right. who has jurisdiction over all interstate pipelines. There's something like 15 gas pipelines proposed for the state of New Jersey. The argument that's been raised by rate council is, do we need them all? And then secondly, you have a huge policy issue, which is called co-location. And what that means is, why should you have 15 different lines going through the state causing disruption when you might have a corridor, hopefully one that's already been developed, where most of the pipelines could go, could use, or where there, there could be shared, mm. shared corridors, and the disruption would be minimized. That's a national policy that should be adopted. And of course, the problem with FERC is the same as the NRC. They have both goals, mm. which is pr uh, promotion of energy, but at the same time, environmental protection. Senator, before I let you out of here, I sure. have got to ask you this. Uh, lead problems in the water, drinking yep. water, particularly in public schools in urban areas, Newark and other places. Give me 40 seconds on that. Well, it's a serious problem. We're finding lead levels to be in, in some of the school systems at the level of concern. It does a total number on our students. 
but it's not just in the school systems. We also should be concerned about our public water supplies to make sure that they're safe and clean. And more importantly, we need the repair of the water infrastructure. A hundred years ago, the pipes that were used were lead. And the way we're keeping lead out of the water mm. is to make sure that the acid content of the water is not so high as that it leaches it out. But a lot of these pipes should be replaced. But how much money? We're talking about billions. Gazillions. Of, okay, but that, so you're, talking about you're talking about tax increases. Uh, absolutely. On whom? Well, let me ask you a question. If you're a New Jersey citizen, do you want to be sick or do you uh, want to be healthy? I, I want to be healthy, so right. I should be willing to pay for more. Right. There's no free lunch, and let me tell you what the answer is. Real quick. All right, 30 years, we're working on this. A water user fee, one cent per thousand gallons. It would generate between 100 and 200 million a year, and that money should be used to clean up our water infrastructure. I want to thank you for joining us, uh, State Senator Bob Smith, who is chair of the Senate Environment and Energy Committee. State thank of Affairs. You, Steve. Catch you on State of Affairs next time here on Public Television Files. Thank you so much. Hey, great stuff. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Jersey Central Power and Light, Passaic County Community College, Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, the New Jersey Association of Health Underwriters, New Jersey Sharing Network, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, and by Johnson & Johnson. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision because you can make a difference and save a life.